This is our planet. We only have one of them. And one of the things that um, becomes very obvious when you start to understand it from a scientific perspective is just how interconnected the different systems in our planet are. The polar regions are intimately connected with us in the UK, um, and changes there have an impact on us here. And that um, follows through in terms of connectedness with um, the Earth's ecosystems, and then with the systems that affect us more directly, our food systems, our water systems, and our energy systems. So one of the things that I'm going to stress repeatedly throughout this evening is the importance of understanding those interconnections. And we do that as scientists through going to places like Antarctica and taking measurements to try and understand the key processes. One of the things that my colleagues um, did was look in detail at uh, the processes affecting the ozone hole and brought the world's attention to the, uh, the ecological problem associated with that. Now, our main focus is understanding climate change and understanding how human activities are driving the Earth system into a, um, a different space. I think the key message that I want to give is that we may still be in for the worst of times. I'm certainly going to outline some of the key threats that we're facing. But I also want to um, emphasize that there are opportunities here too. What you see here in the, in the graph is um, the average temperature of the surface of the Earth, average across the entire surface of the Earth, and it's a time series from 1850 through to the present day. If you look in detail, you can see that there are three curves on there because there are three different analysis data sets that are brought together worldwide, but they're very much in agreement with each other. And the overall message is that currently today, 2015, um, was about one degree warmer than um, before the Industrial Revolution started. And it's not just the global average surface temperature, the many other variables that we can look at, um, indicators of the Earth system where we're seeing strong change. And here's just another. Um, at the bottom is the global average sea level, um, a significant increase again um, from the 1800s um, through to the present day. Now, what's been driving those changes that we've been seeing in our Earth system? Well, here are two other graphs showing strong changes since 1850 to the present day. The first top graph that you see is global primary energy use. Um, and just since the 1950s, there's been something like a five-fold increase in primary energy use throughout the world. And that has driven a dramatic increase in carbon dioxide levels. Carbon dioxide levels at pre-industrial times were around about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere, um, and they're now up at 400 parts per million, a dramatic increase. Now, if we look at where we are at present, if we look just at the carbon dioxide, and I put that 400 parts per million onto that graph, you can see just how far out, at least in terms of carbon dioxide, we are from the natural system over that last million years. Whereas for you and I, except for perhaps um, an increase in flooding events that we've seen particularly in the UK in recent years, we haven't really seen um, the climate change significantly with our own eyes. But people living up in the Canadian Arctic have. And you just have to speak to any of the people up there and they'll immediately tell you stories of how um, the Hudson Bay used to freeze in a way that it doesn't freeze any longer and how that's directly impacting their lifestyles, which are so intimately tied to the ice. So in terms of the Arctic sea ice, um, here are two satellite pictures, um, one from 1992 and one from exactly the same day of the year in 2012. The pink area is the area of sea ice. This is taken in September, at the end of the melt, summer melt season. And you can just see dr just how dramatically the difference in sea ice between um, those two, uh, two snapshots, which are only um, 20 years uh, apart. And if you're not used to seeing maps of the Arctic, it's difficult to really visualize quite how large an area it is. So I've included here <clears throat> a map of Europe and the equivalent amount of Europe that would be 
wiped out of the same amount of Europe was lost as we've seen loss of sea ice. And I think that really brings home quite what a major difference it is. And across Antarctica, we're seeing evidence of um, large collapses in ice sheets. And here is, uh, I just wanted to show you this video. This is a colleague of mine who was um, in Antarctica in 2008, flying over this ice sheet, the Wilkins ice sheet, and wasn't expecting at all to see the ice sheet suddenly collapse, but that's what happened literally in a matter of weeks. What you're seeing here is the front of the collapsed um, ice sheet. This is the height of a 15-storey building, and that's just the amount of ice that's above um, the sea. You can imagine uh, the amount that's uh, beneath the sea uh, on top of that. And the area of this ice sheet that collapsed, as I say, in just a matter of weeks, was about the size of Greater London, a huge area that's disappeared. And these, these things are you know, essentially irreversibly collapsed. It takes a very long time to grow an ice sheet, but a very short amount of time for an ice sheet to collapse. So I wanted now to say a few things um, about some of the major weather events that we've seen around um, the world in recent years, as Gavin noted at the start, and the dramatic impact that they have had, both financially and in human terms. Um, in 2003, we saw a major heat wave um, in Europe, and it's estimated that there were 70,000 premature deaths across um, Europe as a consequence of that heat wave. Um, and we've seen many other um, extreme events um, over the last decade or so. Some of them may be related to climate change, some not, but all um, give a strong indication of how variation in weather can have a dramatic impact on people's lives. The World Economic Forum each year puts together a, a survey um, of what people consider to be the greatest global risks, and um, this is the results of the, um, the survey from 2016 from the most recent um, meeting in Davos. What they really highlight each year is exactly this, the interconnectedness of the risks. The number one risk um, that the survey produced this year was failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation. But if you look at the things that are immediately interconnected with that, water crisis, food crisis, biodiversity loss, um, and uh, I guess uh, a controversial but um, worrying uh, potential connection in terms of large-scale involuntary migration. So I wanted to move now to talk a little bit about the future and the future projections. Um, these are projections that are based on climate model simulations of the future. And um, we input in the, into them different scenarios in terms of what our future emissions of key greenhouse gases might be into the future. And what's shown on this figure here are the temperature changes from now out to the end of the century under two possible scenarios. One, a business as usual scenario where we continue to emit greenhouse gases in much the same way as we are at present. And another one, which is an aggressive mitigation scenario where we go above and beyond what's been committed to already in Paris um, to reduce our emissions still further over the course of the century and to keep our um, temperatures below 2 degrees or approximately 2 degrees um, centigrade increase with respect to pre-industrial times. I've put up here at the same time as this graph a photograph of uh, one of my daughters and my grandmother, because I spend all my time looking at graphs like this, and it's very easy to forget that these aren't just graphs, these are predictions of the future. My daughter is going to be the age of my grandmother at the end of the century, so this is essentially her lifetime, and she might be following the blue curve, or she might be following the red curve, and her life is going to be very different depending on which curve we as a society choose to follow, and I think it's important to remember that these aren't just graphs, these are um, millions of people's lives. How much time do we have um, to try to address um, uh, moving between being on the red curve to hopefully being down on the blue curve in terms of our future? Well, um, the science uh, indicates that to have a likely chance of staying below 2 degrees centigrade, 
we have approximately 30 years left of burning um, fossil fuels at our current rate before we've used up our entire bud budget of what we can put into the atmosphere in order to be able to um, stay below that level. Actually, the Paris Agreement, as I'll come on to say, um, uh, and uh, in the end agreed that we should try to stay well below 2 degrees centigrade and aim for 1.5 degrees centigrade. So you can ask the same question, how much um, do we have left of burning fossil fuels at our current rate before we've used up all we can burn um, to stay below uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade? And it's actually a difficult calculation to do because um, of it's, it ends up being such a short time scale, but it's something like 10 years at our current rate of burning fossil fuels before we, we'd have to stop entirely um, if we were going to um, be able to stay below those levels. This is a map. Um, the data comes from 2010, but you would see pretty much the same map if you look today of where those um, carbon emissions are coming from. And, well, you can try and assess where you think the hot spots are um, but one thing that you can really notice uh, is that the hot spots tend to be in the areas where there are large megacities, and cities contribute a significant amount of um, carbon emissions, which is both a problem but also starts to lead to you thinking of potential solutions. More than half the global population live in cities currently, and that's expected to grow to 70% by 2050. Currently, cities account for about 70% of global energy use, and if you look at the whole of greenhouse gas emissions, they account for about 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. So they are undoubtedly an important focus both of uh, mitigation and adaptation. Right, in the last um, section, I now want to um, come on to talk a little bit about what we could do about all of this. Um, so I kind of laid out the challenge. We're already seeing significant climate change even today. But there's a potential for very dramatic um, changes in the future if we don't move from the business as usual red curve onto the aggressive mitigation um, blue curve or even below it. So how are we going to do that? Um, many of you might have read David Mackay's book um, on sustainable energy without the hot air, and that's now been turned into a, a global calculator, which is one attempt to try and estimate how we might do it. Um, and you can all go and play with the global calculator um, should you wish to. Here is some of the uh, analysis that come out of that. There was a report that was um, produced using it, uh, Prosperous Living for the World in 2050. Um, insights from the global calculator. And I should say that these insights come with a very big ca caveat that this is just one model. Um, but here, here are the three main conclusions that they had in that report. Um, that yes, it is physically possible that all 10 billion people that are estimated to be in 2050 um, could live uh, in a world where they're um, eating well, travelling more, living in more comfortable homes, whilst at the same time reducing emissions to a level that's consistent with a 50% uh, chance of no more than 2 degrees centigrade warming. But, um, and there's a big but in this, to do so we really need to transform the technologies and fuels that we use. And transform in this really means major transformation. And even that's not sufficient. We also need to make um, much smarter use of land resources um, and um, to expand our forests. You basically have to do everything. And another thing that I want to stress in terms of the challenge of all of this is that, as you might have noticed from some of the earlier graphs that I showed, even that blue aggressive mitigation future is a significant change with respect to what we've seen over the last millennia, uh, a millennia, for example. But it's also within our bounds, and particularly speaking to an audience of engineers, to instead of looking at this as a threat, to look at it as an opportunity, and to try to move to define the Anthropocene instead of by um, the great calamity that we as humans have uh, caused to our, our, uh, the world in which we live, instead, um, 
the great innovation opportunity that we've seized in terms of moving ourselves into a cleaner, greener and more resilient future.